Uh, hey there, welcome back. Today we're going to copy a drawing by Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang. Um, it's spelled I-N-G-R-E-S, but you don't say anger, you say Ang. Um, it's called Raphael and La Fornarina. Subject, Ang painted on several occasions. In the painting, Raphael appears in the studio with his fab fabled mistress model, La Fornarina, the baker's daughter, sitting on his lap. Uh, we should probably have a look at the painting while we're at it. Okay, so yeah, this is actually a kind of silly painting, isn't it? Um, Raphael was, of course, a famous artist of the Renaissance, and uh, here he is, um, as described with his model in his lap, um, looking over at his painting, and Frankly, uh, the drawing's probably a lot better, but uh, anyway, so we're going to copy the drawing, which is very lovely, I think. There are st other studies for the painting that are equally as, as good. So we're going to go over here and begin. And today we're going to try to uh, draw the everything we see here. So we're going to draw torso, both the arms. Um, and this is going to take longer, and it's going to be harder. But um, we need to learn to start connecting these heads um, to the body. So here we go. Get rid of this toolbar here. And we're going to start the way we've been starting with the Loomis circle. I got to play with my exposure here because this is a little bit washed out. It's better. And we can imagine the side plane of her head of this nice, very strong tilt. And the Hairline is way up here. The brow line going through the through the center of this ellipse. Bottom of the nose at the bottom. And let me just lock in my focus here. face, the jawline, notice that however large you draw this, you're going to need about, let me mark this up for you. So. This is the top of the head, bottom of the head. We've got another head takes us down to about here. The third head 
to slightly below the rib cage and then the bot last head slightly off the page. So however big you made this, just double check right now and make sure you've got room for three more of these counting down. Make sure you've got this angle right. This is really an extreme tilt. Now it can be useful when you when you're drawing a little more of the figure. So we're blocking things in. Start looking for angles that are the same. So notice that this angle here is almost the same as this angle here, this one here, and where else? Very close to this one here, this one here. If you get in the habit of looking for these correspondences, and then just sort of blocking them in. You're going to make fewer mistakes because you're going to be looking for the way things that are a little bit further away from each other are similar. And I'm going to switch colors over here and then look for things. Another set of parallel lines like this one, this one, this one, this one. This one. See how these are all moving in more or less the same direction. So just looking for these correspondences will force you to Think of the figure as slightly more abstracted, and you won't make as many of the your normal kind of clunky mistakes. And if I switch back to my first color, I can notice that we've also got another one way back here that's tilting the same as those. And see what I'm doing? I see there's this line here and now. This line, the same angle, but way back here behind the back of the shoulder. So that gets us started. And now I'm going to look for the form of the rib cage which is going to be a tilted ellipse. It always tilts back in a normal standing position like that. And that's what we're seeing here. And then we want to think of the pelvis as tilting forward, although we don't really see the front of the pelvis because she's got this kind of flouncy dress. And it goes down like that. start thinking about the mass of her shoulder. Notice it's kind of, if I block in the location of these fingers and then just drop straight down, the mass of the shoulder is centered under the, those fingers. And the upper arm 
notice that the line I made here, which is about three heads down from the top of the head, indicates about where the bottom of the rib cage is and also where the elbow is. And if we look here at the prominence here, notice that the elbow on this side drops behind it and a little bit further down. This stage of blocking things in is extremely important, as I'm sure you know. And I like to have the whole figure blocked in before I get into too much detail on the face. But I don't like to put it off much longer than that, the face I mean. So there's no rush here. Notice I'm, these are important decisions I'm making. So I'm looking back and forth, and making sure that things line up, that the overall shape I'm creating over here is the same as the overall shape I'm seeing over there. And I'm feeling pretty satisfied, so it's time to move on to the face. So I'll get rid of that, and we're going to zoom way in, and we're going to zoom way in over here. That's about as big as I can make that. Or maybe not. That's a little better, huh? So. Notice that this line is supposed to be the hairline, but her hairline looks nothing like that. What I'm going to do is just give myself a little indication of where the center of the forehead is. And then I'm going to attempt just a little bit of shadow mapping. There's not a lot of shading in this pose. So I'm just going to pop in a little shadow there, a little dark right here. And some of these darks. Remember this line here is supposed to be the the brow line, so the eyes should be a little lower down. And I'm just going to shade in a little dark for the line between the lips. Yeah. 
Yeah, I notice her the part of her hair is not exactly in the middle. The part is a little bit to the left of the center of her forehead, so we're gonna put it here. And I'm gonna go ahead and block in that the shape of the hair. See this shape right here? Think of it as it's a little fat kind of S curve. And here's another S curve. And where is that ear? It might be a good idea to put some construction lines in. If I go from the earlobe straight across, I come out above the brow on this side. I notice that this iris is just about in the middle of that line. So let's try that over here. We're going to put a line going through that iris. There's the halfway point, and the earlobe should be back here, which is pretty close to where I expected it to land based on the neck construction. The challenge of this drawing is this is just such a a lovely, delicate, sweet little drawing, and all of our drawings are going to look relatively clumsy and crude. So, now that I have the features just sort of not even blocked in, but just legible because of the you can see the shadow shape so I'm going to back up again and make sure it seems like the the head is the right size for the body and this is the equivalent of sort of standing the other side of the room for a second and from here I can see maybe I didn't tilt the ear enough. You see how my ears, the ear lobe I measured, I, I didn't really get the movement of the top of the ear being a little further forward than that. Um, for you to get that effect, you have to sort of actually take a few steps back. It's, it's what artists do all the time. and I encourage you to do it. Okay, I'm going to zoom close again. Get rid of these marks. And here we go. Notice that the eye in my drawing looks a little short. I'm sorry, the nose. I was just looking at the eye when I said that. So we'll get to that in a second. We're always so tempted when we draw to just lay in some really satisfying dark outlines of things, but take a good look at 
the way this eye is drawn. Nothing is outlined. It's completely tonal. So it's just little shading motions. And we're going to go pretty dark along the upper margin of this eyelid. And then we're going to get into the eyebrow. Again, no hard outlines anywhere. where the white of the eye ends is clearly not where the lower lid ends. This is what we always describe as the lash line of the lower lid, but here it's... There's no dark of the lash even. There's just this little half-tone transition. But this little bit of light here indicates where the where that little shelf projects out. I need to go a little dark through the pupil. And I need to pull this eyelid out to the corner. Pull this shadow in a little bit more towards the bridge of the nose. Now, where am I going to get my extra length for the nose? Notice the nose really doesn't project quite as far as I drew it. And I think the main flaw down here is just just dropping that nostril down, just a hair. And also the shadow around the olive. This sort of contour is created by a series of very light strokes, nothing too dark. And notice the bottom of the nose is in half tone at least. A lot of reflected light though, so be very easy to miss that. But just knocking in that little bit of shadow under there helps make the nose turn. got this very pronounced shadow shape right under the nose, some cast shadow. And guess what? Still made my nose too short. contour down a little. Maybe you didn't make the same mistake. Nostril, a la, everything's just another sixteenth of an inch down. Now notice
notice the cupid's bow between the lips starts really high here and comes down and it's up again something like that bottom lip curves under. And look at the subtlety of this plane change where the color of the lip ends. Again, barely there. Don't, no hard outlining. And then a little shadow shape to define the upper lip just along this corner. And not too much in the middle because it's getting filled in right there by reflected light. And now that I've set my bottom lip, I gotta pull back on the chin slightly. And then I can finally sort of refine this contour. Again, I'm trying to emulate his technique, so I'm not pressing hard. I'm just pressing lightly and going over the line a bunch of times. Sort of like that. Now, there's still a sense that my nose is a little too short, but that's just a, a shadow problem. I drew that, cash, that form shadow a little too high. Like I may have pulled back a little too hard on the bridge of the nose, though. And here's that little darkening for the receding iris and the, this eyelid wrapping around. Again, very clear definition between the end of the white of the eye and that little shelf of the up lower lid and then the shadow under it. Because the head is tilted down so much, notice that we're seeing the cheekbone really come up high and it's coming behind the eye socket over here. And I need to just indicate a little more clearly how, see how foreshortened this iris is? It's also cropped by the nose. I was making it a little too much of a fully visible circle a second ago. So. so here's that brow ridge projection transitioning to the forehead. Notice the forehead is going not quite straight up, it's going still up and to the right slightly, just a few degrees. And then it transitions into that hairline that we already talked about. And notice my chin looks a little bit compressed, so I'm just going to As I darken this contour, which again he's created by a going over the line many times, I'm just 
is bringing that chin down a little. May even have to erase a little bit there. And then sweeping up. She has a very soft feminine face, so the angle of the jaw is not prominent, but we can still see where it is. You always want to think to yourself, where is that jaw turning? It's turning right about there. Because Raphael's mistress is so is lit so frontally, notice that there's not a whole lot of um, first shading going on, not much shadow mapping going on. I'd be hard pressed to tell which hand Ang was drawing with here. It's a sort of very delicately built up surface where all the lines are basically following the form. So we've got kind of a textbook ear going on here. Here's the earlobe. Tragus, anti-tragus, helix, and the anti-helix really kind of does a dive down because of the angle that the ear's at. You don't normally see that. And I want to be careful here to show that the... See how it looks like my jaw is going to end behind my ear? We know that can't happen. So this is a little shadow shape here, but the jawline has to come to a point just in front of that. Sort of like that. And then we can... Uh, Put in some of this half tone along the bottom of the jaw. And there's a very, very soft half tone under the cheekbone. We have to be so careful not to shade any of these half tones with any pressure at all. Here's another one along this cheek. Don't show me anything else with these drawings. I want to see that you're using a really light touch on this stuff. So I'm noticing I'm going to have to just make a little more thickness here along the back of the neck. See how high this is? I sort of underestimated that in my block in. And then before we move on, we're going to try to do something with this hair. Notice there is, let me get my self-portrait out of the way here. There is actually a 
highlight right through here. A little darkening on either side of it. And up here we can see actually some of the first shading. Again, very softly built up in a right-handed direction. perfectly round this is. The hair falling down just a little bit behind the neck. And then this kind of hair piece here. Which for some reason I did not block in before. But we're definitely going to Lock it in now. I'm going to try doing some shading with my right hand and with the side of the pencil to try to get some of that look. is really impossible to get with a pointier pencil. So we have to use the side or what's sometimes called the flat. And let me clean things up a little over here. Assessing my work, I'm noticing that this cheek seems to be pulling forward towards us. That just means I drew it a little too big. Notice how much space I have between here and here. So that's the easiest thing in the world to just trim that back. And it gives her face a much longer delicate look. Okay. When I move the back of the neck to the left, um, I made the neck look too thick. And so what I have to do to compensate is move this line over a little bit too. Much better. A few more touches in the hair. This is where we can press just a little darker in the hair, right? See right above the ear and then this little curl of hair that comes behind the ear. It's a little shadow accent right under it. A little shadow accent along the hairline. And some of these S-curve details on the hair on this side. So, we're now going to zoom out a little more, check our work again. Notice that once those, once that face is in, it's so much easier to see sort of how everything else is working. I'm probably still a little 
slender back here. She's got this really pronounced curve of the trapezius. And after I backed out, I can see I forgot to do the half tone underneath this brow on this side. This brow could also be darker. Now there's a little direction change right here. And then we go straight for a while. Again, cleaning up that edge. And again, light, light touches of the pencil. And then we're going to do this swelling of this muscle, which is not flexed. It's just bunched up because her arm is fully um, you know, pulling against itself. And slow down and pay really close attention to what you're seeing at the at the elbow because those details are important. Even if you don't understand the anatomical forms that you're drawing whenever a bony landmark comes to the surface you have to really slow down and observe it carefully. And notice we have another sort of little S curve here. It sort of goes in and then it swells out again. And we have this little comma shape where those two forms meet. And that's good enough for that arm. A little heavy on my line here, so I'm just going to just soften it with the eraser. Kind of make this half tone under the neck a little bigger. And zoom out just a little more. And here we go. Now when I raise the trapezius, you'll see that the shoulder ends up being a little further back. Honestly, it almost looks wrong. Is this really her back? Um, she looks maybe a little, I don't know if it's muscular or deformed. Ang was sometimes accused of taking liberties with his figures, like adding extra vertebrae and such to create a particular visual effect. And having moved this back a little, I noticed that maybe this arm's going to end up being a little wider. Just because you correct your first draft, though, it doesn't mean that it was pointless to, to have one. 
the corrections in the first draft are much easier to make than trying to get it all perfect on the first try. So here's the, the front of the arm curving up, the deltoid. hitting this little pocket at the tip of the shoulder blade where it transitions to the front of the trapezius here. Look at how subtle that is, but how much information is conveyed by that one little half tone there. Some also very subtle little sort of half moon compression shadows here. Just showing how the skin's kind of bunching up. And a very little darkening here, which I think is the sternum. And then we can kind of see your rest, I think, under the shirt. So she's wearing something kind of gauzy, but it's not too suggestive. And these little folds, these gauzy, transparent folds, just sort of flow and create these little compression puckers between the breast and the waist. Now this over here looks like a sort of an erased or partially erased first try. And here's that swelling of the forearm. Every time I draw a little plane change like this, I'm just checking for correspondences. You see how this swells out at a point just below this plane change here? So I'm always comparing what I'm about to draw with what I've already drawn. And notice that this little puckering at the this elbow is just below this contour here. she's wearing or not wearing is hard to tell, but it looks like the little cloth comes around behind her here, and then it bunches up back here. I try to make these lines with the same kind of looseness that Ang has used. So as I assess my work, can see that I probably put the point of this cheek a little too high. So I'm just going to scoot that down a little. And I also feel like this iris is a little longer. So I'm going to 
scoot that down a little without making it too fat. This iris is, as I said, foreshortened, and I didn't quite get the full height of it. That often happens with foreshortened forms like that. Need a little darkening under that brow. And you're going to see completely different corrections that you need to make. So go ahead and make them. Don't copy what I'm doing right now, but you can pause and sort of watch how my eyes going back and forth between my drawing and the original, and I'm just looking for differences. Notice how I didn't come far enough forward with this eyebrow. Which really changes the expression quite a lot. And I probably could define the top of this eyelid a little better and go a little darker here. Make it look even kind of fuller and heavier. And I'm not going to be able to make this perfect by any means, but a little half tone to define the bridge of the nose here that I didn't put in yet. But hopefully I can make it a little better. something unusual about that nose that I still have not managed to to get. I think where I created the plane change here was a little too low. And what happens when you copy a masterpiece is you sort of, you always have to ask yourself, what bad habits do I have that just prevented me from capturing the beauty and elegance of what I see before me? And in my case, I often feel there's, I have a lot of bad habits. And my copies usually look much clumsier than the originals. But if I did this every day, if we all did it every day, they would get better and better, wouldn't they? If you don't know that by now, you really haven't been listening. Notice this highlight is not reading as a highlight yet, and that's because I just didn't go dark enough on either side of it. It's not pure white, so I, c I don't not, I don't want to erase. I want to darken on both sides. And there's another highlight here that doesn't read either, so I can 
darken on either side of that one too. And finally, here's that little, just sort of hint of a little contour here. Just a little skin fold here. And right behind it, the fingers, which I guess I could zoom in again. to see just how little there is to these fingers. They just sort of emerged from this shadow. You get that little twist of that pinky. And even the pinky nail is legible without barely touching the paper. And notice here too, even in this contour, that here's the nail. And then we go up from the nail, it gets a little fatter. And then it changes direction. And here's the last one. Notice that He's not drawing the fingers like this. Okay, he's drawing them like this. So even if you can't see the nail, this little flattening here gives you the clue that it's a fingertip and not a sausage with a line on it. So you want to try to do the same thing there. Here's a little inside of the collarbone, a little detail I didn't notice before. And also another little detail is this half tone under this rounded form. Um, rounded form between the eyebrow up here and the eyelid down here. And it's important to show the fullness and the roundness of that little form, which I learned in graduate school that some artists have referred to as the sausage, which is not really what you would tend to think of. But there it is. So here's our side by side. Definitely looks like an Alec version of an Ang and not an actual Ang, but that's the best I got today. So I want you to spend a lot longer on this than I did and really try to do the best job you can. All right, thank you very much.